our topic for this evening for the critical dialogue is concerning the effect of the COVID-19 on South African youth. The, the topic in broad terms is the following. Before the global pandemic, COVID-19 reached our shores, South Africa was plagued with a highly unequal society. Youth were among the most vulnerable with a staggeringly high youth unemployment rate. In our critical dialogue, our panelists, which I will introduce shortly, are comprised of change-making youth, where we will discuss the social, economic, and psychological effects of COVID-19 on South Africa's young people. The question that we are trying to tackle here in broad terms is, what will our new normal be, and will we find the creative solutions and the resources to tackle new and existing problems? So I'm going to start introducing our panelists, and then I'm going to give you a quick uh, form of the structure of the conversation discussion, and then we're gonna get going. Cool. So our first panelist is Crystal Duncan Williams. She's from Youth Capital. So Crystal, Crystal Duncan Williams is the project lead for Youth Capital, a project incubated by DG Murray Trust. She has over 10 years of experience in research in the fields of molecular biology, public health, and youth unemployment. She is passionate about unlocking the untapped potential of young South Africans and believes that quality education, healthcare, and employment are the critical building blocks for a thriving society. She has experience in research-driven advocacy and is passionate about making data accessible and engaging for everyone so that they are able and equipped to advocate for themselves. Good evening, Crystal. Good evening, Lance. I'm really excited to be here this evening and um, to be conversing with all of these awesome people. Awesome. Our second panelist is Kumo Apani. Kumo is an alumni from Cornerstone Institute and a registered counselor working at Abbott's College in Claremont. She serves the staff and student community with the aim of enhancing student resiliency, teaching emotional regulation techniques, supporting learners with learning barriers and providing individual and group counseling to students. She has an area of interest in trauma and is recently exploring the area of gender-based violence and fatherlessness. This has inspired her to pursue her MA research psychology at UCT with research aims, which are within the context of particularly high rates of unemployed non-biological fathers in South Africa. As this population group has not been adequately explored within broader parenting academic research. Good evening, Kumo. Good evening, Lance. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to uh, be discussing this with you tonight. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Our last panelist is Jared Raison. Raison, sorry, Jared, <laughs> from Trusted Interns. Jared works in the cross section of three passions people, social impact, and technology. After spending close on five years optimizing and scaling a tech business, he found his greater purpose in the area of career progression. Through the ecosystem of his company, Trusted Interns, Jared is using tech and data to remove inefficiencies, facilitate opportunity creation, and enable informed decision-making for the community and partner organizations. Everything he does is designed to transform South Africa to a place of inclusive prosperity for all. Good evening, Jared. Good evening, Lance. Uh, good evening to all the listeners out there. And uh, I'd like to echo the sentiments of Crystal and Kumo. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be here and honored. Uh, and uh, I look very forward to some engaging conversation. Thank you. So to, to start off our discussion, we're going to start off with each panelist giving a five minute statement about the broad uh, topic. And then we're going to start digging into the more finer details of the discussion. So that will be about 15 minutes. Thereafter, we will, we will do a broad top level discussion for about 25 minutes. After that, we will do uh, 20 minutes of mental health uh, tips. And then the last 15 minutes are for the public who are welcome to at any point make comments or ask questions on the comment, in the comment section. Um, so the last 15 minutes will be specifically assigned to those questions. 
but you're welcome to to to, uh, to ask questions throughout. Okay. So shall we head? Shall we go? Uh, let's start off with with Crystal. Sure. Um, thanks, Lance. So um, youth capital has a network of young people across the country through our social media platforms. But very specifically, um, we started a pilot project with um, youth capital influences in the Western Cape, Gauteng and Eastern Cape. Um, and so in the in the aftermath of, of first social distancing and then in lockdown around COVID-19, we've been really um, very actively engaging specifically with those youth capital influences. Um, the things that have come up again and again for us from our network at, at, in this time is one, that young people in communities feel that communication has been poor um that a lot of people in communities don't really understand what's going on um that the presidential address the presidential addresses have all been in english and there maybe hasn't been um enough effort made around creating posters and content in local languages um they say that not everybody has access to watching the tv many older people um, in communities are not on social media um, have limited access to data um, and uh, have limited access to even community radio stations um, and that the information getting passed down is being lost. So that's been um, a big concern. Um, in Gauteng particularly, the group has been very concerned around communities not adhering to the lockdown rules. It was just a conversation this more often and actually for, with some members in the group complaining that, you know, kids are playing in the street and um, what can they do? Taxis overcrowding, how, what, you know, some of them are essential workers and still having to go to work and are fearing for their safety um, in public transport. Um, and then um, anxiety um, around um, post, those in post-school um, learning institutions, how do they keep learning? Data is an issue, um, connectivity is an issue. Um, you know, finding a quiet space when you're living in, in a small shack or a small home with lots of people in limited space, finding, finding quiet spaces to concentrate um, and to continue working online is really difficult for, for the youth that we've been engaging with. Um, and mental health has been a, another one that's come up again and again, so I'm really happy that that's part of the conversation tonight. Um, young people feeling isolated, young people who are already feeling stressed about being unemployed and now wondering what this lockdown and this pandemic will do to their employment prospects. Um, and so a lot of anxiety around that, around um, mm. their families, around being exposed um, and yeah. a lot of fake news. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of been um, the main things that have come up many times in our conversation with our young people in our networks. Yes, yeah, so it sounds as if this, the status of communication and information is very important and the, the ability to distinguish between what's factual and what's false is obviously very important in this whole process. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Crystal. Uh, Kumo. Oh, thank you so much, Lance. Um... Yeah, I think for my side, uh, so I am a registered counselor. So I work at a school setting, um, work at Abbott's College. Um, and, you know, in my engagements, um, I think exposure, even in, in having to work in different socioeconomic um, statuses um, within the community, my experience in um, working with an NGO that deals with, with families in, in places like the Cape Flats, in, in Haderfeld and Manenberg. Um, as well as Athlone. So I think in, in my experience with having to see students as well as uh, families individually has really, I think within the two um, groups of people, those that you know are exposed to uh, better education as well as those in poorer communities is that we see the underlying developmental stage of the adolescent uh, person really being um, just the who am I, identity crisis and virtue of trying to really see themselves fitting within the broader scheme of society. And I think mm -hmm. the, the biggest, you know, um, aspect of wanting autonomy and independence, which speaks to, you know, employment, which speaks to how does uh, a student or a young person create a framework or a, a, mm -hmm. a world in dreaming about the type of career they want to see. 
you know, and I think it's, it's, it's important to look at our historical setting within the, the South African context as well, uh, mm. with, you know, the unemployment rate, particularly with, un with, 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 young, with young people, you know, and yeah. see how some of the psychological distress really um, has come as a result of that. You know, lots of feelings of helplessness, um, really not being valued, their self-worth, uh, their core identity really being affected mm. as they develop mm. as young people, you know, and mm. so you see the pandemic being a big threat, you know, in terms of seeing the high rates of unemployment that do exist already and how do, does one psychologically transition into this uncertainty that I think many South Africans are having to really engage with, it, with at this point, you know, in having mm. to know what would life look like now for me. So there's been a lot of containment that, that has been needed um, from mental health uh, workers, particularly in terms of my role in, in, in assisting and giving care in this time and having to allow room for emotions like that to unravel, but also engage in how to cope, I guess. Yeah. With, with these, yeah. 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 yeah so so uh, from what Crystal just was saying and what's emerging is that there's a very deep sense of anxiety that's present amongst youth, uh, you know, despite the fact that they face challenges of defining themselves and their identities and everything. They still have this massive problem of trying to find work um, with, with the added dimension of the COVID-19 virus, really uh, magnifying all the insecurities and, 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 and feelings at this point in time. So yeah, that, that is quite an important thing to understand and, and also an important critical service that you're offering you know, to, to, to children and youth. Um, yeah. That's great, thank you. So, our last panelist, uh, Jared. How's it, Lance? Uh, it? Look, I I can echo pretty much everything that Crystal and Kumo have said. Uh, we have a community on the Trusted Interns platform of over sixty thousand youth, uh, the majority of which are unemployed. Uh, they cross. Um, the education spheres right from current secondary schooling students right through to postgraduate students. And one thing we try to do as an organization is really engage with the youth to understand the barriers that they face on a day-to-day -day basis in terms mm -hmm. of progressing their career, whether that's through education or through a, a gain for employment. And we can see in the data I mean, there's facts, there's opinions, uh, and there's assumptions. We can see in the engagements through the platform and through surveys that there has been a severe spike in anxiety, uh, uncertainty, um, and essentially before this, the youth were in a state of despair as is, as everyone yeah. has said. Um, yeah. And we've got uh, comments that are coming through our online chat uh, which is often used by the youth uh, just to seek guidance. How do I do this? Where can I find that? They're literally just looking for someone to talk to. Uh, yeah. And if you look at the sentiment trends in those conversations, as well as the sentiment trends and uh, just comments that are happening on social media, uh, it yeah. really is it's painting quite a dark picture. I mean, if you look yeah. at uh, when we launched this project uh, close to three years ago now, uh, the youth unemployment statistic was just north of 50%. Uh, and in a very sure. short time, we are now pushing 60%. So that is a 10% increase. And this is now for the 16 to 24 year old demographic in, a, yeah. in not a very long space of time. Uh, and the, the majority of that, uh, uh, the increase in that statistic has been in the last 12 months. So, uh, and that was before COVID. Uh, the one thing that we can see is that based on our most recent survey, uh, 60, 2%, I lie, 65% of our current community have said that they're unemployed and 3.5% uh, of them have said that they have been retrenched since the COVID-19 crisis came about. So yeah, yeah. look, we can definitely see in the stats and the data that things aren't looking positive, yeah. uh, which isn't a great place to be. And this is why it's important for every single South African, regardless of who you are and what your social economic status is, is to come to the table and come together 
and engage in that critical conversation, have the difficult conversations that many people are too scared to have because it will force you to face a very real and severe reality um, mm -hmm. and ultimately see what we can do as a society to mm -hmm. enable anyone to take that next step into their career because access to career opportunities really should be democratized. Everyone <coughs> should have the opportunity to progress regardless of who they are and where they come from. And yeah. um, I think it's conversations like this that I mm -hmm. think are a good first step you bring the, the, uh, a diverse group of people around the table to yeah. uh, engage on a critical basis. And hopefully through this, the youth are hearing it. They can see that yeah. there are organizations out there that are willing to help them. And Absolutely. hopefully every other stakeholder comes to the table and we can do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, what, you, what you're saying here is quite interesting because when you have access to data and, and, and a lot of people don't have access to data, you kind of have an idea of where things are going to be in the next you know, few months because data generally tends to follow certain patterns, right? Um, so when, when, when you have this, 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 this data, bank of data available to you, doesn't that also create more, a deeper sense of alarm for you as a person that's actively trying to make the positive changes? I wouldn't say it causes a state of alarm, to be honest, because the statistics before now were just as bad. If you look at them, don't look at the absolute value. The fact that it's gone up by a few percent uh, shows that it's getting worse, but it was really bad before. Uh, yeah. What it does is it helps us uh, engage with our partner network and our community to help everyone make informed decisions. Because yeah. uh, I think it was either Kumo or Crystal that mentioned that uh, there's a, um, a concern of fake news being spread. Yeah. And there's also the concern of the, the, the state addresses and any communication from government only happening in yes. English. So yeah, yeah. the other statistic that I can point to is that we have asked our community, what is your primary source of information right now in terms of following this crisis? And 72% are getting the information through social media, okay. which, but th that brings positive and it brings negative. <laughs> so the positive is that most people have access to social media. You do get um, Facebook lights. School learning um, for, who fall behind and just are left to figure things out for themselves. Um, why is there not a catch up strategy yeah. in place that educators are, um, are, are having to follow? Um, and now with schools being closed, that national catch up yeah. strategy and that call from us becomes even more important. So I think in, in the data we put yeah, out yeah. there, um, in the bigger societal problems we were facing before Corona, um, I think it's our job as, mm. as, as the voices in that space to shape that conversation and say, we realize mm. this is a crisis now, um, but this is mm. why we need to focus mm. on these things as a society now, because absolutely, actually it's always exactly. Different. It's more important than ever, exactly. Yeah. So there's this picture of how things were before and the challenges that were present, but also what's going to come in, what we need to anticipate and what are the things that we can do to put in place to, to ensure that, first of all, the voices of youth are still heard, that all their feelings and anxieties and insecurities are heard and that we can help them as much as possible. So, I mean, I, I, I want to, to ask a question, are, are government in, interviews Interventions enough to protect young people, and also are the private sector doing enough to help the youth? And is it their responsibility in the first place to help the youth? questions uh, uh, anyone them all together and saying how are we making sure that all of these youth policies actually speak to one another and that uh, because youth unemployment is not just the responsibility of the department of labor um and youth yeah. education you know already goes across two departments of education and so how do we get these mm. government departments to really work together you know at youth capital we really believe that's the missing link um mm. Uh, and, and broader stakeholders as well, that even the mm. private sector, they'll have their CSI budget and their own 
little projects that they want to get off. But how do we start, as Jared was saying, how do we start pooling all of these resources, uh, yeah. policy, yeah. money, willpower, um, in a collective kind of agenda Absolutely. setting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we really believe that's what's been missing. Yeah. So, so coming back to the individual uh, youth member, youth person in South, in South Africa, Kumo, how do you think this, you know, if, if the youth can perceive and see that there's so much intervention has been put in place, but nothing has been implemented, nothing is going to be effective, how do you think that adds to the experience of, of opportunities and, and, and the, the, actual, the actual endeavors to, to find employment? No, thank you, Lance. Um, I think just to add a little bit on what Crystal and Jared, you know, mentioned about, I think part of the role that, you know, people from different um, factors or spheres can, can play in, in contributing to, I guess, mental health work for the individual, you know, is thinking like things like accurate information, you know, that, that could help, I think, to curb the rise of anxiety. Uh, but I think I'm thinking particularly for the vulnerable uh, people with pre-existing mental health conditions, you know, before, you know, the pandemic itself and how, you know, having to now deal with issues like this is, you know, it's, 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 it's allowed an increase, an increase of the anxiety that, that, that's rising. So I think mm -hmm. just in terms of having an outlook as to what the picture looks like for the individual, um, is both ways. I think it's, it's the responsibility of systems that needs to be put in place like the government and really evaluating a consistency plan of whether these, you know, engagements that are happening about, you know, youth unemployment initiatives, how do we measure the impact of that? You know, you find conversations that have been having, you know, uh, regarding NESFAS, regarding education and how to better, you know, put that in place. But is that being effective? Um, are more poorer communities being reached once, uh, you know, as, as an asset uh, But I think it's also just in terms of the individual and having resources of support for the individual themselves, you know, uh, whether that's mm. on a clinical picture or whether that's the more family interventions that need to be um, considered there. So I think it's, it's both the individual and having to look at the broader scheme in terms of the society and other roles that need to be um, included in there. But it's also, I think, looking at the individual themselves and what is lacking um, for them as to what the disadvantages are there for them as, as, as individuals, but also what are the opportunities that can be taken advantage of. Yeah. 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 No, I'm sorry, I'm in there. Absolutely. I, if you had something to say, it's just, uh, it's Kumo and Krista have both touched on a very key point, which is the bigger picture. And mm. I think what everyone needs to identify is that the challenges that the youth face are so much bigger than unemployment. Mm. And there are so many factors and variables that speak to the youth unemployment statistic and contribute mm. to it. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, if you look at the, the, the career, the career progression of an individual, it's everything that comes before getting a job. And that is your uh, early stage child development. It's your primary, secondary schooling. It's your tertiary schooling, if you have that, uh, that privilege. Uh, then it's navigating into the right career path, not just into any. And then once you've done that, it's all the support thereafter, the mentorship, yeah. the coaching, yeah. The skills yeah. development uh, and if you think about or if you ask the question is the public and private sector doing enough to address mm. this i think you need to come back to that exact same point of looking at the bigger picture maybe uh one needs to think about the fact that any implement any initiative that either the public or private sector is delving into to generate economic activity and to yeah. stimulate economic activity is one way of contributing yeah. to uh, social unemployment. Um, and I think the real thing yeah. that everybody needs to just shift their mindsets towards is the long term. And Absolutely. So, but you're talking about, sorry, sorry, Janet. Please carry on. I've got lots to say. I'll, I'll wait for later. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So you're talking about stimulating, you know, macroeconomic situation, but the, 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 the person on the ground doesn't understand what, what it is that they need to do in order to 
put themselves into that bigger picture, you know? So we can understand the bigger picture, but as an individual, when you're dealing with feelings of helplessness and you're overwhelmed and overcome by feelings of anxiety, it really becomes difficult to, to motivate yourself and to, and to continue, you know, plowing into whatever it is with the hope that somebody's going to recognize you, somebody's going to see what your work is. And that inevitably then cuts into your feelings of low self-esteem, low self-worth, and that, that, that becomes corrosive at the end of the day. So it's quite a challenging situation that we have, but yeah, we, we, we're focusing on solutions here and we're trying to think about what it is that we can how envision for ourselves. What is the new situation going to be like and how do we, we, we take our toolbox of, 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 of uh, solutions that we've already uh, created and then transform those, those tools into something that's going to be sustainable moving into the future and also making sure that the youth ultimately feel heard and understood you know, by the government, by people, that their voices aren't lost, ultimately. Absolutely, Lance. And I think it's important for us to always remember that we have to meet young people where they are and not try to make them fit into our box of what the world is or how they function in it. Um, and I think, um, you know, we started doing something actually just slightly before lockdown, which we're calling WhatsApp webinars. We're not the first people to do it, but we have found it's been a really great way to meet young people in a space where they're already, most young people have access to WhatsApp um, and to really use that as an information tool. So, um, you know, we realized we had started it in discussion around the national youth policy, which is out for comment now. Um, but when COVID-19 hit, we created a WhatsApp webinar group specifically around COVID-19 and, and any questions that young people might have. Um, and actually tomorrow we've got a WhatsApp webinar on mental health in the time of lockdown. And we've got a clinical psychologist joining us for that webinar tomorrow. Um, the details are on our okay, Twitter awesome. page. Yeah. And so we're finding, and, and, and next week, Wednesday, we're going to be hosting a conversation around the national youth policy now that's a 40 page document in a very jargony kind of way as an example yeah. um, of something yeah. that young people can't really engage and access with and it doesn't feel real to them it doesn't feel like their experience um, and so we're taking yeah. that and we're pulling out what we think young people care about based on our conversations with them um, and packaging it mm. into little discussion sound bites that can stimulate a discussion on a whatsapp mm. chat which mm. most young people can have mm. access to they can voice their opinions um, and so i think it's really about finding ways to meet young people where they are making information available to them in a way that they mm. can engage with um, absolutely i think that's that's critical yeah so making making information accessible is definitely a priority um, and then also um, giving the youth the right facts the facts so where they can distinguish between what is false news and what is factual is very important so um, that's that's a really great contribution, and I'm glad that there are things already in place for youth that they that they know they can go to someone if they need help and if they're feeling overwhelmed with anything. That there are channels that they can use to be helped. So I want to ask Kumo a specific question. Um, thinking about the feelings of anxiety, you know, cabin fever, and possibly feelings of depression that is as a result of the lockdown, how do you think it is impacting them at this present moment and how will that impact them moving forward? Um, thanks, Lance. Um, I was actually thinking about the, um, just on a general public uh, emotional stages that we all are experiencing and going through now, you know, and having to, mm sort of go through the, and initially it was, you know, this lockdown experience, we, we, we have it, we're going to get through it, you know, be better people on the other side, you know, and still have to face the reality that a lot of things are going quite online, you know, so it's not yeah. only anxiety versus, you know, I'm struggling personally, but it's how do I engage, um, even for a young person that's looking for a job right now, is, you know, interviews are having to be done online now, so it's having to now read yeah. That the labor force is looking quite different now, you know, and that yeah, the nineteen things will be quite different, you know. Um, so I think part of, and I like what Crystal yeah. mentioned around connecting to with the other in this time. Um, the most I think important yes. thing 
um, or rather the most difficult thing you can do for a human being is to isolate them, restrict them, you know, to a place. So I think everyone is just as a natural urge to resist <laughs> um, a lockdown or a quarantine experience. Um, yeah. So I think in terms of moving forward for individual is having to, which will be quite difficult for many, but try to see this as a temporary situation and okay, cultivate yeah. ways mm. of motivating self, you know, for instance, something yeah. simple as, you know, creating a technique or a schedule for yourself, you know, um, a routine mm. that's going to actually create, you know, um, uh, a way of being positive about your day, about, you know, being being productive about the day. Something as simple as waking up, get, you know, into mm -hmm. the shower and start your day. You know, it really okay. does have a psychological effect on, you know, um, what you can do. And I think in terms of just the data and the information, the fake news that's coming on, I think part yeah. of what we've been engaging uh, young people with is to actually try to control that, you know, to actually have some time to pause mm. away from that mm. and rather look for information that's factual, whether that's from the, you know, World Health Organization or websites that are actually, you know, accredited mm. and have facts. You know, I'm sure Jerry can can, can add on to that. Um, but rather yeah. to have a, a place where you can control the kind of information that you're receiving that are triggering anxiety, and they will. You know, but it's trying to find a way yeah. that will allow you to have a time away from this to actually process okay. what is my life and how can I create a world where I can still see a possibility for me. Um, in yeah. Terms of yeah look like uh, but rather you know creating a way where you will be surrounded by a level of motivation for for the next coming season which is quite uncertain okay. um, yeah. But, um yeah trying to hone on to techniques and tools that you can do such as setting up your day setting up a schedule yeah. um plugging yeah. into content and people that will be productive you know um, yeah, in, in your, yeah. Yeah. So you're really, you're really highlighting the fact that it's important to, to understand that the situation is temporary, uh, albeit very anxiety uh, invoking. Um, and the fact that structure and routine is very important in managing your day. So, so it's important to hold on to things which are, are I suppose, create a sense of familiarity. Um, and also what you said, the word reframing is, I think, is quite crucial because how you, how you frame a problem, how you frame uh, your circumstances and, and, and therefore your, your response to those circumstances are very important in determining the, your, your mental health and your emotional well-being uh, in general, but more specifically, you know, in the situation that we face with, that we face with yeah. right now. No, definitely, so, definitely. And, and I mean, I have someone who just did one simple and powerful thing was, you know, to really just change even the word lockdown to solitude, you know, and how Yeah, can, solitude, yeah, exactly. Yeah, how, how can I be more self-caring in this time? Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. It to, to, to that versus looking at it as a threat. Absolutely. And yeah. producing, you know, agents yeah. that really isn't going to yeah. help anyone at the end of the day. So. Yes, absolutely. Many people have said that our, our strongest weapon against the COVID virus is uh, self-care and, and, and uh, um, you know, uh, looking after yourself. Uh, and obviously prevention uh, is, is the best cure. So that a lot of people have alluded to that over the last few weeks. I have a question for Crystal and Jared. Um, young people feel like it's pointless to continue planning their lives at the moment. Uh, with so much uncertainty, should they still be applying for jobs and to uh, test the institutions at this point, or should they just take a step back, pause, and uh, live in limbo for a while? What should they do? I um, I know that Jared's got um, some thoughts on this, um, but I uh, just from our side, what we're really fighting for at Youth Capital is around the zero rating of um, resources that young people can use to upskill themselves in this time. So we we know that the world's going to look different post COVID nineteen, whether it's post lockdown or post social distancing. I mean, none of us really knows how this is going to play out, um, but what we do know is that young people can use this time productively. So there are online courses. Um, and if we can 
fight the good fight with some zero rating and some more affordable data, then young people can use this time to do short courses online, to um, be able to add mm. some skills to their CV, um, to learn some interview mm. techniques, um, and really, instead of feeling yeah. like their lives are on hold, to use it as a time to really upskill themselves. But data is going to be the critical lever for, for yeah. that being possible for young people. I'll hand over to Jared. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Crystal and Lance. Jared? Uh, so, look, there's so many ways to look at this conversation right now. I think the one thing that is obvious, yeah. uh, at least to us, is that this shouldn't be a time to do nothing and to take a holiday and to yeah. um, just retreat, um, which could be a very yeah. contributing factor to uh, increased anxiety. Uh, we can see in the uh, yeah. engagement on the jobs boards and our platform that the number of jobs available uh, for the youth demographic has decreased substantially. Mm -hmm. Uh, in some instances, we can see a drop of mm -hmm. uh, over 80% in the available vacancies in terms of internships, learnerships, uh, and graduate programs. Uh, but we've seen the online engagement of the youth increase substantially. So okay. they are more eager to do something, but the opportunities are fewer. So it can be okay. very easy to uh, amplify the despondency in that regard. Uh, but to echo what yeah. Crystal said, uh, this needs to be a time of self-development in some way or form. Uh, and I think that the yeah. one thing I can encourage every South African to do, uh, or at least every South African who has the ability to do this, is to have a conversation yeah. or a few conversations with the youth. Uh, okay. Because they are uncertain at the best of times. Mm -hmm. So to be uncertain in a, in, a, in a period of mass uncertainty for the world, mm -hmm. it, you can become very lonely very quickly. And again, yeah. if I look at the sentiment towards some of the online engagements, um, a simple five minute conversation with a, a concerned uh, unemployed individual can really just center them. And that Absolutely. five minutes can, uh, as a five minute investment from us, either from one of our team members or part of our mentor network, um, mm. can really just put that youth on the path that they need to go on now to either yeah. find an opportunity to learn a new skill or, yeah. to or to develop their soft skills, which is a huge yeah. barrier for them to enter the workplace, um, yeah. and ultimately increase their chances of um, securing gainful employment post lockdown yeah. or post social distancing, as Crystal said. Um, yeah. look, I, I think it's a time to do these things, but at the yeah. same time, if I look at what Crystal said and meeting the youth where they are, which is what yeah. they're doing, it's what we're doing, we know that they yes. have a, they struggle to actually do that. And that's okay. why we as a collective need to come together and help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe Lance, if I can just jump in there on exactly Jared's point now. Um, mm. You know, we often in these conversations say, oh, what can the youth do? How can they do this? How can they do that? But well, as a society, um, mm. I often say, you know, it's uh, at, at Youth Capital, we say, you know, small actions lead to big change. And and mm. youth unemployment feels like this overwhelming thing. Eight million young people not in education or employment. That's huge. Where do I start as the average South African on the street? I say if every employed adult had a conversation with one unemployed young person, that would mm. change, um, that would change so many lives. And it's a simple conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of young people feel like, oh, it's me and I'm not good enough. I mean, imagine rejection mm. after rejection after rejection for years at a time as the data shows us. And if one yeah. employed adult can just have a conversation with a young person around, like, yeah. this is yeah. how you can go about this. Talk to me about how you're going into your interviews. Oh, actually, maybe that's not a good idea. Young people just, mm. they don't know, they have behaviors to mm. model. And so if, Absolutely. you know, the rest of South Africa who may be, are stuck in lockdown and have some extra time on their hands um, can start mm. finding ways to reach out via WhatsApp or whatever it is um, with mm -hmm. a young person mm -hmm. in, in their networks, beyond their networks. Um, I really mm. think that could be a huge impactful thing that could happen in, in this time of kind of lockdown where things are maybe mm. a little bit slower for people. Lance, if I, if yeah, I can so just this is you. Go ahead. Go, cool. I, I just want to... Um use this as an opportunity to communicate to the youth out there who are listening, uh, to let mm. them know that there are people who are concerned about you, 
There are people who want mm -hmm. to see you make a success of yourself. There are people who want to support you and there are people who want to have conversations with you. Uh, mm -hmm. Every single one of us on this webinar right now, I would imagine is one of those people. Uh, mm -hmm. We have something called the Trusted Mentor Network which is a crowdsourced mentor program where any individual in South Africa who wants to support the youth in any way, whether it's in a one-on-one -on -one conversation through a group WhatsApp session or through hosting a webinar or writing a blog, um, we've got that network who we are eagerly wanting to pair with the youth who need that guidance. So mm. either if you're an unemployed youth person, if you're um, uh, an unemployed individual or sitting in a, in a, in a, at home not sure what to do, please come speak to us online. We will help you. If we can't help you, we will find someone who can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's this massive cry for help, you know, that you guys are listening to every day and we're hearing the voices of, of, of the youth that, uh, you know, that I can imagine that they are often feeling marginalized, excluded and, and, you know, left out from life. So you guys have an ear to, to, to what they're saying all the time, but more importantly, you're pointing out the fact that there is a, huge need for mentorship and coaching and for people to take youth under their wings and, and to guide them and, and to help them you know with, with the challenges that they do have so that that message is coming through very clearly um i want to to shift the discussion quickly to to the role of the parents and caregivers of, of the youth uh, because this is obviously a very important aspect of taking care of the youth so uh, Kumo, can you give us some ideas about how parents and caregivers can support their, their adolescent children uh, and loved ones uh, through this time? Because I can imagine that they are also experiencing high levels of anxiety. So how do you take care of someone else when you're also struggling with your own issues? Um, yeah, Lance, I think if you just think of a home full of children running around, you know, <laughs> I must be... <laughs> crazy thing to have to organize you know and yeah. uh, I think even just in terms of finding a space or a schedule for the adults themselves the parent giver or the, the caregiver you know and having to set up a system or a, a setup um, yeah. that they're able to almost control have some control in their day and in the way they are creating healthy ways of dealing with the situation mm -hmm. and engaging you know um, their adolescent child in the conversations as well um, I think it takes one person to change sort of the dynamics of the of the behavior in the family and it just spirals down within the family. You know, next thing yeah. you know, the family is laying down in bed, they're all in pajamas all day. <laughs> <laughs> and no one is being productive, you know. So I think it's things yeah. like setting boundaries, I think, which is quite a it's a perfect time to be setting things at boundaries, you know, with your children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just using opportunities like that. You are confined in one space, you know, conversations need to be had. Um, yeah. and setting down, you know, boundaries like that. And there's amazing websites, you know, for um, I know a lot of parents that are doing, you know, homeschooling in this time as well, you know, learning content that's there. And those that can't access, you know, internet in this time, you know, and the Minister of Education mentioned, you know, programs, you know, on TV that may be available you know, for, for young people in this time, particularly grade 12s, you know, who are having yeah, yeah. Quite a whole shift of how their year will look like. I think if anyone yeah, wow. in February, you know, that mm. by March we will be locked down, you know, it yeah. will um, yeah. be better things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's yeah. sort of talking things through with the adolescent or with their children around setting a new norm, a new boundary, mm. the boundaries yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but also also cultivating an atmosphere of you know positivity and learning I like what Jared said about don't just sit back and do nothing um, a lot of things are going online so there's a lot more accessibility there's a lot more connect accessibility as well engage develop a skill develop a hobby you know keep exercising things like that that really would keep you refreshed and engaged you know it is mentally mm -hmm. Um, to try and have you, yeah, mm. focus and, and mm. cope with what's happening. So parents definitely on a more taking care of themselves, but I think they're scheduling and creating boundaries for one, mm. a challenge, a good challenge to have with the yeah. family. Um, yeah, so the parents are, are, are becoming teacher, um, psychologist, 
a nurse, everything all at once, which, which can be quite a daunting task. But I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that most parents are it because yeah, ultimately they you know, do anything for their children. Yeah, just to mention one thing, and I know for, for the bigger um, population around online counseling, which is, you know, I think you mentioned families that are more constrained in this time, not having mm. privacy for one, you know, and looking at commu pure community communities and, and how to navigate, how do I have my own space, you know, um, in that mm. time. And even, even just things like things are not face to face anymore, it's different. But also, yet again, taking advantage of the fact that I think I'm having more students connect to me um, that haven't had the boldness to come to me, you know, in my in my office at the school set up. Yeah, exactly. Kimoa, Kimoa, can I please schedule a Zoom session with you? Um, and yeah. things like that is actually having to go. This could be a, a great way to finding help, you know, and to, yeah. to, to getting counseling and, and psychological support in this time. And things like joining a group, a support group, you know, which is, I think, being encouraged a lot. Things like that that are definitely helpful in terms of containing emotions at that level, at least, you know, yeah. for all the rising emotions that are happening and understandably so, to find spaces of containment, um, mm. even for parents and, and caregivers themselves. So, mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, awesome. This is like a lot of brilliant information that you've, you've given us. Um, I mean, Jared and Crystal uh, and yourself have really contributed amazingly to this discussion so far. Um, we, I just want to remind the, the public to send off questions uh, that we're going to start addressing um, in the next few minutes while we end off our discussion. The discussion is still ongoing. But uh, if you are sitting through questions and comments, thank you so much. I do see them coming through now. So are there any comments uh, from Jared or Crystal at this point? Um, look, I think Kumo mentioned some very valid points there. Um, and I think the nature of the world is progressing to one of being online as much as possible. Uh, and whilst we are very much living in a digital divide in South Africa. That is hopefully not the case uh, for the long term. And what we, one of the things we're trying to do is to destigmatize the business sector and to shift their mindset to one of attitude as opposed to aptitude. So when you're looking to employ the youth, the expectation to hire someone with experience is a common uh, phrase that's thrown around. And if the youth can adapt their mindset to one of growth mindset and to one of abundance and to one of positivity, they will be the ones that are best positioned to access opportunities post Corona. I mean, if you think about, I don't know about you, but every conversation I've had in the last two weeks, if it's with someone that I haven't engaged with recently has started with, some sort of check-in around Corona. So when the youth ultimately do start going to interviews, whether it's tele telephonically or via Zoom or face-to-face, -face, it is going to be a discussion point. You are going to be asked, how did you find your situation while you were in lockdown during Corona? What did you do to uh, make your time uh, productive? And it, it, again, it just comes back to taking the long-term view and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, what questions uh, uh, the public has out there so we can see what, they, what they're thinking of. I'm sure there's a lot of things that we haven't quite discussed yet. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm also quite sure that the public are, are keen to, to, to see, uh, you know, and, and have access to specific links where they can access, you know, all these services and, and information uh, that you guys have all spoken about. Crystal, any comments? Um, I think that. Um... Kuma and Jared have covered um, a lot of ground. Um, and so I, I think just to echo what, what they have said and that, you know, young people, they lacked social capital before all of this. Um, mm. Young people often found, felt like it's only in their community that this is a problem. Um, mm. Is it only year that we can't find jobs? Um, is it only year that, you know, um, we all, so many of us dropped out of school? All these issues, these big uh, societal problems that young people face. Um, 
they're all going to be exacerbated by Corona, but at the same time, it is an opportunity for more connection because we're forced to do that. Um, and so if you are a young person, really tap into the networks that do exist. Um, mm. You know, uh, you, you might be signing up to a trusted interns where maybe they, you know, there's going to be a bit of delay before you can get placed because of Corona, but there's a network of young people there um, mm. and there's a network of support. And so I think we mustn't underestimate just having a space to talk to other young people and realize, oh, it's not just me, actually somebody else on the other side of the country in Limpopo is experiencing the same thing and I'm not alone. I think there's a lot of value in that and Nyangpu should use this time to to connect as well um, and yeah. to really start to start learning from each other. You know, if you have a, if you're a young person who passed a, a subject at, at a post-school age level or you did matric already, reach out to other young people and say, hey, like I can help you with this in this time. Um, we really all need to, to help each other. Um, so I think just to add that. Yeah, there's an incredible opportunity for us to all connect, but also for us to, to consolidate on our learning and also create pathways for ourselves, you know, where we continue learning um, and decide on a conscious level what it is that we would like to learn and how is it going to be applied and then invest that, uh, that learning and energy into finding specific jobs uh, for, for the skills that you've acquired during this time or in the past. So yeah, there's, there's a great opportunity for, for everyone right now to, to take positive steps towards their own development. So uh, that's very important. Um, I'm noticing a few comments coming through now. Um, I suppose as I read out the comments, uh, Crystal and Jared, you're welcome to tell us more about what you're doing and how that uh, where you guys are placed at the moment in terms of youth intervention and stuff. But let me first uh, read a comment. So this comment is from uh, Rene Nguenia. She says, a few years ago, unemployment amongst graduates was at 60,000, including young graduates, also known as the unemployed qualified. The question tonight is, what can tertiary institutions do to help the unemployed youth? As much as young people are encouraged to enroll in tertiary education, there is the concern that they may still not be guaranteed a job post their studies. So I think that, that comment really speaks to, you know, how do we take something from theory? How do we really uh, write our CVs on a practical level? How do we actually develop the confidence uh, to actually sit down and uh, speak into an interview that's not face to face, but firstly it's been done, you know, uh, through Zoom or whatever. Uh, how do we how do we go about actually, you know, addressing those issues? Okay, I'll jump in. Um... So the first thing I want to say is that the responsibility doesn't lie only on the tertiary institutions. There, there really are multiple stakeholders that each in their own individual rights can contribute to helping the youth progress their careers. Um, yeah. From a tertiary institution point of view, I think you can split that up into a few different silos. Uh, there are matriculants who are now looking to go into um, some sort of education field. The question is, do they go into a rapid learning four to 10 week short course to equip themselves with a skill that they can use right now and apply right now to monetize right now so they can start supporting themselves? Do they go into a TVET college, which is a huge push in uh, uh, President Ramaphosa's new uh, six step plan in terms of addressing the youth unemployment statistic. The reason that that is a huge contributing factor is multifold, but it's largely to, uh, embrace a, a hybrid model of learning where there is a workplace learning component where whilst you're studying, you are mm. at the same time gaining experience to increase your chances Absolutely. of employment. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, then there's the students who are already in the tertiary system uh, who are now looking to exit it. They have largely been equipped with some form of knowledge that mm. they can take into the workplace, but have they been equipped with all the softer or what we like to call essential skills? to actually thrive mm -hmm. in the workplace. Do they, skills, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, we've just found that oftentimes there's too much focus on the hard skill and on the, the competency of the individual rather mm -hmm. than teach them real world skills that they will need to uh, possess 
in order to both enter and then thrive in the working world. So one yeah. of the things that we're looking to work with the institutions on is to run a yeah. program that ultimately takes an individual uh, through a very engaging experience uh, mm. where they are encouraged to learn how to um, conduct themselves in a Zoom interview and to yeah. learn yeah. how to use Zoom because this ultimately will become the norm. When the That's university the starts to open yeah. up again, they're gonna to go to campus and they may have access to a computer where they can have a Zoom interview. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's really about uh, just changing the, the approach to not thinking what do I need to give, what do I need to equip the youth with to enter the workforce and in terms of applying knowledge, but also what tools do you need to give them to access the workforce? Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at uh, skills, hard skills and soft skills, and looking at how does how does the youth, how do they approach uh, the work, the workplace, um, you know, from almost a strategic, empowered point of view. I mean, the workplace itself is uh, characterized by a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of complexity and a lot of ambiguity itself. So now with the COVID virus, there's obviously a lot more challenges that they need to, to, uh, to address and having a very clear picture of what skills it is that they need to be effective and to be successful is, is really important. Um, I just want to read out another comment quickly. Uh, also by Rene Nguenia, short courses may assist now. However, the job market expects trained or academically competent workers. Young people are forced to again engage in low paid income space. This is a bigger concern at a larger scale. Young people need to be prepared now to be able to compete within the fourth industrial revolution environment where expert skills will be a necessity to be active in the job market. So we've got the fourth industrial revolution thing also coming through here, which we haven't even touched on, but you know, so, there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of challenges that are, are quite overwhelming. Um, um, yeah, I think... Oh, Tume, you go. You go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just want to sort of comment on the, you know, being better prepared, I think, you know, at um, or, or what, what other interventions can be put in place for the young person in terms of equipping yourself. And I think the one that I do always encourage um, young people is to job shadow and to start sort of exploring from that level. So in terms of primary mm. interventions with things like career guidance, that's really mm. not actually emphasized as, mu as much as it's, it's needed in terms of the value that it gives a young person is how many people can, you know, make a, a, an opportunity of actually doing a career assessment, you know, mm. to try and see how can I measure myself you know, interest along with what's needed or the demand of the workplace and how yeah. do I marry the two in terms of what my passions are as an individual, but also yeah. what what skill can I do at the moment while studying, like Jared mentioned, to sort of, you know, yeah. upskill myself for that and prepare myself for that. But I think yeah. a lot of adolescents are going through a more um, identity sort of question yeah. in terms of what kind of job do I even want for myself? Yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Career assessment on a more preventative level or mm -hmm. primary intervention level can really assist um, young yeah. people in, in engaging further within yeah. themselves. Yeah. Uh, Kumo, do you think that these skills that we've, we've uh, identified are, 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 is it part of mental health care in general? So, what skills are you referring to? The, the, the skills that we've uh, spoken about with, with regards to addressing you know, challenges like the fourth industrial revolution, having hard skills and soft skills. Are those skills important or does it, can it be put into the context of mental health care itself? Oh, definitely. Um, I think if you look at things like, you know, um, identity formation or autonomy, you know, the need for independence that an individual has, um, the yeah. best thing to do for yourself, for your self-concept and your self-value is to mm. see what contribution you can give to the greater society. You know, and obviously linking that with the passions and the talents yeah. that you have and, you know, in believing in the very primary, you know, uh, thought of actually, I, I am valuable, I have something to contribute, and mm -hmm. this can benefit people in this, in this you know, um, aspect. So mm -hmm. I think that in terms of developing skill is a huge aspect, you know, in trying mm -hmm. to 
um, to to elevate motivation. I think in, intrinsically and extrinsically, and mm, mm, people mm. understand exactly their individual value. Mm, mm, mm. in the workplace. So definitely, I would. Agree. Okay, awesome. Uh, Crystal, there's a comment here directed towards uh, youth capital and uh, trusted Indians, but I'd like Crystal to answer this. This comment is by Lubabalo and Dobe. Uh, I have a question for both youth capital and trusted interns. Does this current crisis we're facing actually shift or affect some of the plans or initiatives you had in mind for youth? If yes, what are you planning to do to make up for that shift? Um, sure, that's a great question. And it's something we've been asking ourselves a lot over the past few weeks, uh, and we're trying to figure it out. Um, so Youth Capital, um, we're not a, a work placement opportunity or connection to opportunity like Trusted Interns and many other um, organizations doing great work um, in this space. Uh, and we're really about um, creating a network of young people who are activists around the issues of youth unemployment and are actually um, coming up with local level solutions to youth unemployment in their communities. Um, and that we tie mm -hmm. those small actions into big policy change. Um, and so our big yeah. plan for the year, we had launched our Youth Capital in influencer pilot. We were really excited. It was the first year it was running across Western Cape, Eastern Cape and Gauteng. Um, and we chose um, around 70 young people who are already influencers, leaders in their communities. Um, and we had a training program for them. And the idea was that they would recruit teams of young people in the community and they would take two actions at a local level around the issues of youth unemployment and edu access to education in their community. So obviously if people can't meet, they can't be taking action in their community and we've had to rethink our entire program for the year. So the answer to the question is mm -hmm. it's changed all our plans. Um, and yeah. so what we're really doing is how do we take our advocacy online? Um, and so with that, we are obviously providing, providing data is then crucial for our network if we want them to become active online and we have to give them the tools to be able to do that. Um, and so mm -hmm. in answer to the question, we have rethought all our plans. We are in the process mm -hmm. of figuring out what that looks like. Um, and if you mm -hmm. want to see how you can support these um, campaigns of young people, you know, just follow us on social media because that's the place mm -hmm. where they're gonna be happening now. So yeah. in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. Okay, Jared, do you, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for asking that question, Luba Balo. Uh, I think it's important for, again, you giving us an opportunity to tell the youth and the, and the societies out there how we plan to support you. So much like Crystal, uh, our plans have very much changed, but what hasn't changed is our values, our vision and our purpose. So that's what guides us. Uh, our purpose uh, from a social impact point of view is to help unemployed youth get their first job. That is not going to change. We are still going to run initiatives and activations and campaigns to do exactly that, but the mechanic through which we do it is going to change. So one of the things we are doing is we are mindful that uh, during the coming months, um, COVID has had a severe impact on physical events, face-to-face -face mm -hmm. events, that youth at tertiary institutions or even uh, just matriculants rely on to engage with career guidance counselors or with uh, coaches or with uh, employers to understand about a particular industry or a job type or uh, um, employer themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. And they often do this through activations on campus or through career expos. Mm -hmm. So essentially mm -hmm. what we've done is we have taken our existing infrastructure and repurposed that to be able to deliver all the value you would normally get at a career expo mm. in an online mm. event, um, which will be happening over a, a three week period, sorry, a four week period between Youth Day and Mandela Day. So uh, uh, in the coming months, the youth can look forward to uh, engaging with us, hopefully data free, uh, much like Chris mm. we're currently having many of those conversations. We're trying to remove mm. that barrier. Um, mm. To attend workshops on soft skills, to attend mm. webinars on how to present yourself on Zoom, uh, to attend mm. um, uh, any sort of session that can equip them with those skills that they need to enter mm. the workplace. Mm. And then once they have done that, uh, we will uh, monitor the data throughout that entire process. And then at the end, try and make introductions between the youth 
and mm. someone that they can have a meaningful conversation with, whether it's yeah. an education yeah. institution or an employer. The other thing we're doing is, uh, just the final thing is, we had a campaign at the beginning of this year as a partnership with Uber. They were mm. our mobility partner, where mm. we essentially offered free Uber rides to anyone in our community to help them get to and from their first interview, to remove the okay. transport barrier. We still have funds available in our Uber mm. fund, uh, and we've raised further funding from a, a philanthropic organization. And we are now looking to see, whilst the Uber vouchers make no sense because people can't go anywhere, how can we repurpose that, uh, that fund, which is designed to remove barriers and in, in, uh, increase access to solve yeah. right now? So yeah, there's a lot going on and um, it's changing on a daily basis. So let's, let's chat again next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, okay. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, discussion and, and and points being referred to the fact that uh, from Kuma's perspective, number one, youth don't always have access to simple things like a standardized psychological assessment where they can determine for themselves what are my inner cap capabilities and talents, uh, um, and 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 you know what is it that I would like to express as an individual, and what are the different possible job opportunities that exist out there where I can find expression. Um, to that innate capacity. So that, that's the one thing we, I think adults, not adults, uh, parents and caregivers should really help uh, with aligning the youth's innate capacities to, to opportunities out there. Um, and and that, I think that's where the internships and the mentorship programs really uh, add so much value, you know? Um, and if, if an individual is able to match up what their innate capacity is with uh, an environment that helps them, they will, they will definitely flourish. So these are all fantastic uh, initiatives that you guys are doing uh, and projects that you're leading. It's really positive and inspiring to hear that you guys are doing such uh, uh, work. There was a comment by Jacob Mary. He said that uh, internships combined with dedicated mentorship programs. Is that a possible uh, way to, to move forward? Is, is that currently being done or is there potential for that to still be done? So this is exactly what we've launched now. So uh, one, one of the things we have on our website is an online chat uh, and we find ourselves um, having conversations with the youth every single day to give them basic guidance and advice virtual mentors, if you will. The honest mm -hmm. truth is we have a very small team um, and we have over 60,000 youth using our platform, which is why we have now created the Trusted Mentor Network, where we are calling every citizen in, in South Africa, if you have the ability, Lance, you could be one of these, Kumo, Crystal, you could be one of these. If you are willing to commit any of your time, it could be you could write a blog, it could be having a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one uh, each month with your yeah. designated um, person. Uh, yeah. Mentorship in combination with any youth employment program, whether it's an internship, a learnership, uh, a YES program or grad program, mm. it is, mm. it's paramount to ensuring that that individual has not only now been granted an opportunity, but they are now being, being uh, afforded a platform and a support system whereby they can thrive in that opportunity. Mm. Because really, conversations we often have is we'll place individuals in a in a in a workplace learning program or an internship and they could be earning anywhere between three thousand six hundred and ten thousand rand a month it depends and what the common trend is in terms of conversations i've had is that great we have gotten an opportunity now we can survive mm. and that is the mentality the fact that they are being um, paid a stipend to pay their, for their transport and their food, it's still only a survival opportunity, but how can we help them thrive? And that's really where the mentorship component comes in. Because as I said, a small five minute conversation can literally change the path and the trajectory of an individual. And, it, and it's in the power of everyone to do so. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and maybe if I can just jump in there around, around exactly Jared, Jared's point, you know, as, as employers, if you're going to take on a young person in an internship role, um, then in order for that internship to be meaningful, you really have to give that young person 
work experience. That's about more than the day-to-day -day of doing the job and how to use Excel and send an email and those like very practical skills. But um, you know, as we were, as I was saying earlier, young people don't have a model of what it looks like to show up for work and be in a work environment and an office culture and all of those kinds of things that I think a lot of us who have been working for a while take for granted. And so from an employer perspective, if you're going to take on these young people and the opportunity, really, really, you know, em kind of impart that knowledge into young people, because if you're just seeing them as like cheap entry, low level labor, then, then the system is broken and it's not going to work. The young person's not gonna get value out of it. The employer's not gonna get value out of it. Um, and it creates um, this perpetual myth that young people are lazy or because they're not showing up for work. But you know, have you had a conversation with them around how much of their salary they spend on transport, on getting to work and how many younger siblings they're supporting back home to send to school and to buy school shoes and all of these really real issues that I think a lot of employers in South Africa are just vastly out of touch with. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely the sense of being um, out of touch with the real issues that people or things have, you know, uh, from a day to day uh, level. So we 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 always we're also talking specifically about how do we create bridges between you know the formal sector, the informal sector, the the, the older employed people, uh, the youth that are unemployed, because uh, a lot of the solutions it seems to be uh, to to lies in bridging those gaps and making people more aware of the realities that people have and people then taking ownership and taking responsibility you know, for um, the situation and not um, you know, shifting responsibility to someone else, but really taking ownership uh, for the situation. I just want to sort of add on that. Um, I, I really love the model of empowering uh, the future leadership of our country or the future leaders rather of our country. And, you know, I was engaging in the model of, you know, um, the psychologist that was speaking about how to implement programs to train the members that are already within the poorer communities and how they can be uh, um, mentorship from that level, you know, in terms of they aren't in areas where there aren't access to resources such as mental health care or even affording a psychologist at that point, but rather having programs that will equip people already that are within the leadership and within the communities in terms of skills, in terms of how to deal with things like, you know, basic trauma containment for people that are there or like literally passing on of skills. And I feel like there's a beautiful image of the old with the young coming together and the buddy buddy system and a mentorship system that really mm. could work in terms of bridging mm. the gap um, mm. that we're dealing with in our country. So I think it's a beautiful way of envisioning what we, 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 we could look like. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and one of you um, said this, this earlier, I think it was you, Jared, where um, we need to, to shut down mentality or our psyche, if I can say, from uh, a scarcity mentality to, to an abundance mentality. And, Realizing that we have more than enough resources to help everybody, uh, you know, and, and it's just about mobilizing those resources and sharing and, and caring enough for, for everybody to be able to, to make sure that we grow together. Absolutely. So I think um, it's during times like this that communities come together. I think it's times like this that the youth will be surprised how many people out there are willing to help them and who are willing to engage with them. And the other uh, sentiment that I mentioned is, is shifting to the mentality of the long-term. So any employer or concerned citizen who is able to invest some of their time needs to see it as exactly that, which is an investment. The investment that you make and give, by giving the gift of your time in an individual or a group of individuals will have a <coughs> uh, If you are able to help one individual empower themselves uh, and support themselves, that then ripples out to them being able to support their families. They can yeah, then support yeah. their community. Uh, anything they earn can then be spent on local businesses, which can stimulate the GDP and economic activity. And ultimately, yeah. at the end of the day, that five minute conversation you had, or that 60,000 Rand investment in a stipend for one year in a YES program, that is all an investment that will be contributive to an inclusive and prosperous society for everyone, Absolutely. which yeah. may only happen decades or generations from now, which is the sad mm -hmm. reality, but it's the small steps yeah. that we have to take to get there. Um, yeah, and I think 
What the youth need to realize now is that South Africa has gone through trying times for decades prior to this. Mm. Whilst this may be a particularly trying time, mm. there are many stories of individuals who have uh, triumphed through adversity. Uh, there are individuals like Busi Siwa Mabuso, mm. the CEO of Business Leadership South Africa. She grew up in a uh, white city, Jababu, in uh, Soweto. She walked to school in shoes too small for her. She had one meal a day. She had nothing yeah. on her side. And look where she is right now. Yeah. There's Kaid Langer who used to yeah. forge yeah. train tickets to get to college and used to sleep on construction sites. Look where he is right yeah. now. So yeah. Yeah. you can make a great success yourself and don't yeah. let your circumstances dictate your <laughs> Yeah, exactly. There's so many, there's so many success stories that we've not even heard of, you know. Um, so it, it's really important to bring those stories to light. I just want to quickly um, ask Crystal to comment on something uh, that you've just mentioned now. The investment that people make. <clears throat> Um, is not is not an investment that is um, material, if I can say. It's an investment in human capital. Uh, it's an investment in social capital. Can you just comment on the importance of social capital? Absolutely. So um, the stats will tell you that around 60% of, of young South Africans have less than three people in their networks that they could ask for, for advice from on educational employment opportunities. Um, mm. I think all of us here in this conversation can probably look back at our career history um, and uh, even access to bursary op op opportunities, um, access to study opportunities and see how we got those through our networks. We didn't just mm. stumble across them randomly. Um, yeah. And so that is the way that the world works. It's, it's who you know, it's the things you're exposed to. And the truth mm. is most young South Africans just don't have that exposure. Um, and mm. I think that social networks um, and social capital Capital is often what, what's forgotten. Um, and youth capital, mm. the name actually comes from that. We believe in the capital of the young people of South Africa. We have um, often mm. people speak about the youth bulge and a ticking time bomb. And there's all this negative connotation around um, mm. this massive group of young people who are sitting around doing nothing. The truth is young people yeah. are not doing nothing. They are desperately trying mm. to do many things. Um, it's just how we mm. as society value those things. Um, and so there's huge yeah. untapped potential in these young people. And like Jared was saying, we need to start viewing their skills differently. Um, mm. You know, if you yeah. hustled every day at the taxi rank selling packets of sweets, that should go on your CV. It should be valued. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's a yeah. skill. You showed up every day. You managed your money. You managed your, 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 um, yeah. your stock. It should go yeah. on our CV. But we don't value those things. Unless you show up in a suit and a tie to an office, it's not yeah. valued. And so we really need to start changing, changing those things and seeing mm -hmm. the, the untapped mm -hmm. potential in young South Africans, mm -hmm. seeing how the system has failed, them, yeah. how they had to you know, survive on one meal a day and no school shoes and all of those things exactly. and the struggles they've overcome and, and start mm -hmm. valuing that mm -hmm. as the capital mm -hmm. instead of thinking about the financial all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it comes back to what Kumo was talking about, reframing. You know, we all have to reframe our, our perspective and, and our, uh, pers you know, perspective on this whole situation and, 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 and go from seeing a ticking time, Bob, to seeing untapped, unlimited potential. I think that's a paradigm shift that um, everyone need, needs to, to, to kind of uh, take part in. So, uh, Kumo, do you have any suggestions about how we can positively reframe the situation? Um, I love that, Crystal. I think, thank you, Lance. The storytelling power of our nation in particular, South Africa, has been an amazing thing. Um, mm. And that speaks to framing, reframing, languaging. Yeah. How do you use yeah. language in your conversation? How do you use language to you know, uh, perceive or paint a picture a dream mm. together with others in terms of how uh, you want your community to look like. And I think it's from an individual mm. level and it's also a pulling an inviting space. Um, and yeah. I think if you look at just the creativity um, that comes out of moments that are incredibly difficult in our nation and how things like poetry, things like dance, things like mm -hmm. things that come out as expressions from the young people, which are really just cries whether that's to the government, to the system, to the inequality that's facing mm. you know, our nation is really also mm. just looking at honing a lot of that talent and expression and seeing how mm. 
avenues like that can be more recognized, like Crystal said. Mm -hmm. and yeah. value, you know, to things. Yeah. Like that. yeah, I think that's a wonder way, wonderful way to um, to end off our discussion. We've, we've got uh, but seven minutes left, so we're going to be taking off. So I really like this idea, you know, and of having a send down message which says we are in control of our own narrative. We are in control of our own story. Every single day that we are faced with, with adversity, we have the opportunity to, to write our responses. We have the opportunity to, to write how it is, you know, uh, we want the, the story to end. We have this incredible opportunity to envision for ourselves a positive end to the story. And we are writing that story every single day through our actions through our thoughts, through our, the way that we manage our feelings, through the way that we manage our, uh, our networks, through the way that we, we reframe this entire situation. So it, it's so important to be able to, to, to write out our story and end off on, on a happy note. That's, that's amazing. So yeah, we are ending off. So do we have any other comments um, or questions? At this point, I'm going to jump in with uh, with a closing with a closing comment. Um, yeah, Alonso, I think that that sums it up perfectly. Um, and and our story that's everybody's story. Um, you know, it's not just a young person; it's every single South African is writing the narrative around youth unemployment, um, whether they mm. realize it or not. That they have an opportunity, even if it seems really small to change the outcome of that story, yeah. um, even if it is in a generation from now. Yeah. Um, and so absolutely to echo all of that, yeah. to say um, youth capital is always putting data out in mm. cool and engaging ways. We have a publication coming out at the end of the month. Um, so yeah, please follow us on social media. Um, if you're a young person, you can find out what other young people in our network are doing. Um, and if you're just uh, you know an engaged citizen, there's definitely information there for you too. So um, yeah. yeah, I look forward to engaging with everybody further. Awesome, guys. Do you guys want to share your contacts or, or, or um, details while you're making your closing statement? Right, Chris, I'll I think dive back in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are youthcapital.co.za um, on social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's all Youth Capital SA. To get in touch with us, it's info at youthcapital.co.za. Um, so very easy to find us. Um, in either any of those will will get you to us. Um, and so please head on through to any of those platforms. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, uh, Jared, do you have any closing statements? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I think I just want to uh, channel my optimism and positivity to everyone out there, uh, particularly the youth. Uh, I want you to know that we recognize your struggle. Uh, we're doing everything we can to pull together the right partners and collaborators to give you the best possible chance at taking that next step despite the circumstances. And just know that no one's road is straight. Everybody journeys a very narrow road. Everybody starts climbing the staircase without knowing what's at the top of the staircase. What's important is that you keep climbing that staircase. Don't stop. Yeah. Take those next steps, even if you can't see the final destination. Um, uh, if you'd like to engage with us, uh, our platform is www.trustedinterns.co.za. Mm. Uh, all our social media channels are at Trusted Interns. So that is uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, we share a lot of content on our socials. Uh, we're sharing a lot of content right now specifically to Corona. Uh, this coming week we are launching a 13 module um, uh, program to educate you on all the different aspects of Corona, how you can identify it, how you can stop the spread, how you can um, uh, communicate to the rest of your community about the program. That program is going to be 100% data free you will not need to have mobile data to engage with it. So it's completely democratized. Anyone has the access. Um, if you are looking for any sort of opportunities, go to our website, just sign up. Uh, we communicate a lot by email there. If you are not youth and you're just looking to help, um, please go to our website, engage with us on, on the online chat, or uh, you can email me directly. Um, the, the email address is there. Um, and thanks very much for having us, Lance. And thanks everyone else awesome. for your input.
it was such a pleasure to have you on, on our panel. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you, Crystal. Kumo, are there, are there any, uh, any last closing statements you'd like to make or important contact details you'd like to leave with the viewers? Um, yeah, um, so you can contact me directly by email. So it's kumo.apane at yahoo.com. Uh, and my work email at Abbott College is kapane at abbott.co.za. So do email me, connect uh, with me. I'd love to hear stories. I'd love to hear um, just information about where you're at as well. Um, and I think for me, in terms of just communicating a word of encouragement, really, for young people at this point is, um, taking advantage of every and any opportunity that you are facing. Um, just to add in on, on just something that Jared mentioned in terms of um, you are valuable and you add value to the community. Mm -hmm. So it's an important thing to, to acknowledge and accept for the individual to know that you are important yourself and your contribution mm -hmm. matters to the world. So any opportunity to really dig deep and if that's spirituality for you, um, to really mm -hmm. go into who am I in this world that we live in? And how can I make a contribution um, that's worth yeah. from the understanding that you are loved and you are valued uh, intrinsically. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, I'm really, really grateful to, uh, to have conversed and had conversation with, with all of you guys. Amazing, yeah. amazing work and I'm so encouraged myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, we are ending off now. Uh, so thank you to everybody that's tuned in. Um, I hope that you found the discussion um, valuable. I hope that you are able to take something away from this, this discussion and then also try and make a difference in your circles uh, and, and, and believe in the impact that you can make and not give in to uh, despair or a sense of hopelessness. It's important for us to all um, stay grounded, to stay focused and to, and to reframe the situation in a way that's positive and to write our story, take ownership of it and to, and to believe that uh, our story could end on a positive note for ourselves and also for the future generations. So this, is a, this has been a great opportunity for me as well. I think you, for engaging me and uh, for, for doing such a great job. Thank you to Crystal, thank you to Jared as well. Um, I just want to remind the viewers that the feed will remain on our Facebook page, should you want to share it. And um, if you know of anybody that missed out on our discussion and would like to access this information, it is accessible on our Facebook page. So yeah, we've reached an end to our critical dialogue. And um, yeah, thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.